Wire-Tier Fifth Estate, brought to you by Voyager Internet, independently tested by TrueNet as New Zealand's fastest ISP for home and business fibre internet connections. Call them on 0800 4 speed for $69 unlimited internet per month. Welcome to Party for the State, where we wrap the most important news events with the best political panel on television. Joining us tonight to discuss China's threat to start a trade war if New Zealand complains about their substandard steel, leader of New Zealand First, Winston Peters, Labour Party finance spokesperson, Grant Robertson, political commentator, columnist and blogger, Chris Trotter, and New Zealand steel organiser and industry coordinator for communications with Etu, Joe Gallagher, thank you for joining us, panel. Remember, viewers, you can send in questions and thoughts to tonight's show off our watianews.com and the dailyblog.nz platforms. And you can email us, watia5e at watia603am.co.nz. Tonight's guest Twitter commentators are Morgan Godfrey and Karen Foreman-Brown. Follow them and join in the debate right now using the hashtag Watia Fifth Estate. Let's get on with the show. There have been mounting concerns for some time about the quality of Chinese steel imported to New Zealand after the Chinese factory that made the steel strand for the Waterview Connection roading project was found to have provided fake test certificates. The factory, Austin Innovation Materials near Shanghai, made about 600 tonnes of the strand for bridges and highway ramps on the $1.4 billion West Auckland project. In response, Pacific Steel, the sister company of iron miner and processor New Zealand Steel, has lodged a confidential application under local and world trade organisation rules for an investigation into China dumping cut price steel on the New Zealand market. China has responded by threatening retaliatory measures against New Zealand's trade, warning it will hit dairy, wool and kiwi fruit imports. Winston, this is a remarkable escalation. If there are genuine concerns about the quality and safety of Chinese steel in New Zealand, why shouldn't we have that investigated? Well, of course, it should be investigated. Uh, but the real question is, how did it get it here in the first place? Who was doing the testing? And where were the shortcuts involved in the contract? But, you know, the uh, steel issue, the Zespri issue, the Melamine issue, uh, sorry, the Fonterra issue, uh, are not different. They have different circumstances, but the uh, conditions behind which they are occurring, uh, as unsatisfactory as they are, are not different. They're not new, and uh, you know it's got quite a long history. The melamine disaster and scandal was turned around against uh, Fonterra, and then of course, uh, within the space of three years under this government, the Chinese got control of uh, infant formula approval for plant business. So if you're going to be selling infant formula out of New Zealand, you have to get approval from the Chinese. Now, there isn't a Chinese mother who will buy the Chinese product. So how on earth do we get ourselves under this national government into that very, very parlous situation? So it's nothing new about it. Uh, what surprises me is all those people who are feeding this information as news or something different when it's not. And it goes back to the very inferior arrangement we entered into in 2008 with the Free Trade Agreement, which some of us, I might remind you, warned New Zealand against. But of course, the two leaders carried on regardless, and now here comes the aftermath. Winston, you've, you've been one of the most vocal political voices in warning of the dangers of free trade. This example effectively proves you're right, doesn't it? Well, you know, there's nothing so turgid as the statement, I told you so, but we darn well did. And the, the fact is that we, just because we're a small country, uh, we should uh, never sell out our sovereignty. We should never sell out our right to first world standards. And recently, the Singaporeans sent a whole lot of Chinese railway stuff back saying this order's up, not up to standard. We don't want it. We want our money back. And that's how a small country, size of Lake Taupo, behaves. Why shouldn't we? Grant, four hours ago, the government backed down on claims it didn't know New Zealand industry were being threatened. Why is John Key not being honest with New Zealanders over this? Oh, it's absolute chaos. I mean, you've got Todd McClay coming out this afternoon saying, I was briefed when I was in China 
that there was uh, the potential, you know, effectively Zespri, we now know, coming forward saying, hey, we've been threatened potentially with countervailing duties if we go ahead with um, this kind of investigation. I mean, there are only two options. He's either got no memory and he's not capable of being a minister or he's deliberately covered this up. And I think the government's been scrambling. If I was a minister and I got told that, you know, products going into our largest export market were about to be shut down in terms of our access, I'd be moving heaven and earth to do something about that. I don't feel the government's been in control of this issue from day one. Um, there's been misleading, there's been obfuscation, there's been an attempt to cover it up. If there's a problem with Chinese steel coming into New Zealand, and there clearly is in terms of quality issues, yeah. as you've been saying, but if there's also dumping of cheap steel in, in large quantities, we actually have the mechanism to do something about it, and we should do it, and we should get on with doing it. The circus we've seen in the last week is unbelievable. Grant, the government's decision to outsource to China over New Zealand products that's the problem here, isn't it? Uh, it's part of the problem. It's not necessarily the problem around the dumping and all of that. that. That's a separate issue. But in terms of saying, let's get the lowest cost products yeah. into our government procurement is a problem. And, you know, there is actually no reason under our free trade agreements that we cannot specify things that mean that New Zealand businesses get a fair go. Yeah. And that's, that's what's gone wrong here. The ultra purist approach to how we manage our trade arrangements is the problem. Joe, how can Pacific Steel and New Zealand Steel compete against Chinese steel that is 40% cheaper and substandard to the steel that you produce? Look, we, we produce um, high-quality steel, but the challenge comes where the only OECD country that has no tariffs on the importation of the steel, and you see the US has just come out and put 450% on Chinese steel. The Australians are ramping up the pressure on their tariffs. And also, I agree with a couple of things Winston said. We really don't have a decent checks and balance um, system in place in New Zealand, and we really need to make sure that we've got a process in place that is checking these quality at the front end. I talked a lot about this yesterday. You know, there needs to be a system that's checking at the front end. It is no use once it's inside these infrastructure projects or it's five years down the track. It's got to be at the front end. There's not a level playing field, and we're talking about a significant um, player in the New Zealand employment market like uh, New Zealand Steel, yeah. the government needs to be doing more to support them. Joe, do you think that there's steel in circulation within New Zealand right now that is Chinese but is substandard and has somehow gotten through the process? Yeah, I, look, I, I think there is. Um, we've seen a couple of big projects where the, um, some low-quality steel has got in, and I don't think we've got a, a proper checks and balances system in place to pick up some of the steel, you know, and that's of a you know major concern to me. We have a perfectly good mill at um, Glenbrook that employs well over a thousand people and mm -hmm. punts significant money. Uh, example, 138 million direct benefit to the economy and 55 yep. million to the government tax take. We should be doing more to be supporting that mill. Joe, what's sort of? I, I, I'm 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 not an engineer, so walk me through. If you've got weak steel, what's the actual problem there that that it will just crumple? Well, there is a potential. I'm not an engineer either, but we've seen that you know with the Christchurch earthquake, we've yep. seen some buildings and some serious collapses happen. We need to be confident as we rebuild Christchurch and potentially, and God forbid that we have another event, and we yep. could have one anywhere in New Zealand, that the stuff that we are putting into these places is going to hold up in the event of a you know earthquake. Yep. And you've seen what will happen when the ground shakes buildings collapse and we need to make sure that the steel that we're putting in is of the highest quality to withstand some of the seismic shocks. Why, why, wise words there Joe. Um, look Chris, how much of this threat to us on our trade is connected to the ruling against China to the South China Sea? Is it, is it connected? Well it is all of a piece uh, in as much as China feels under a great deal of pressure at the moment. Uh, the South China Sea situation being especially irksome for the Chinese government. Yeah. But when you're dealing with the Chinese, it's always extremely important to bear in mind you know, the cultural elements of any kind of uh, diplomatic relationship with that country. The Chinese, um, like many of the peoples of Asia, have the concept of face. Yes. And to lose face is not something that anyone 
whether they be um, the president of, of the People's Republic of China or a bus driver in Shanghai, the, the loss of place is something that is always felt very keenly. So right. when New Zealand encounters a problem like this, the last thing it should do um, is take uh, any disagreement public. And that is why the government, I think, tried to keep this um, secret for as long as it possibly could. Right. To the extent that you know, Todd McClay was, was, was clearly dissembling um, with the news media. Yeah. Uh, and the news media knew he was, which wasn't a tenable situation for him for any length of time. But the way to solve this problem, or perhaps the way that we should have attempted to solve the, this problem was to alert the Chinese government to the fact that there may be a problem with one of their yep. steel suppliers, to talk to them about how to better test, to more reliably test, to more methodically test product coming from that supplier, and so allow the Chinese to solve the problem right. and to let us know that the problem has been solved. Do you now, we are in a situation where, where the Chinese stand to lose face, they right. don't want to lose face, and they are angry that we haven't been able to keep this um, under wraps. Yep. Uh, and they have ways of speaking which allows the government to say, no, no, we are not involved in any of this. And strictly speaking, that's true. But in a state like the Chinese state, the government doesn't have to say something for you to know that the government will do something. Right, right. Winston, Key wants huge Chinese corporations in New Zealand to help build our infrastructure. If we can't trust the materials they import for our buildings, how can we trust China building our buildings? Well, the problem is that Mr. Key uh, and others have brought themselves into a massive house demand problem, a lack of supply situation in Auckland, and he goes from bad to worse. Mm. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why we're bringing in so much of these cheap, inferior products is because we want to cut the price of the consumer back. Well, how does that uh, match the housing price massive escalation in Auckland? The answer is it doesn't. And uh, when you talk about New Zealand steel, of course we should have gone for New Zealand steel first. Uh, we are the makers of cement. We brought in 40,000 tonnes of inferior cement and buildings were constructed of it, including the Manukau, new Manukau Court. Mm. Uh, of mm. course, they won't admit any of that. Nick Smith denied all that in Parliament, but there'll be a day where that is proven. And the, the real issue is who are we actually protecting or looking after in terms of safety and security and things like that when we allow such things to go on? Uh, I uh, quite understand uh, how the uh, Chinese government uh, would view this. Yep. But the plain fact is where were our sets of standards, yeah. so much so that we've got so much inferior plumbing stuff coming in, when that behind the wall starts breaking down, you'll see fifty, dollars $100,000 of damage being done and no one will take responsibility. It's the 1992 National Party changing of house standards all over again. When will this country ever learn? And it, I mean, how do you save on cost when you won't allow our guys to build the railway structures in this country? Exactly. You get it in from China, infested with asbestos, yes. and back it goes. How much junk do you have to buy before you realize this is not the best China's got and we should be accepting nothing but the best from them and, and ruling out all the rest by a properly constructed standards authority rather than having all these bureaucrats running around thinking about a political ideology and the next best view of how the world works rather than good, honest specialists doing the job to look after the New Zealand people. Thank you, Winston. Grant, did the free trade deal Labor signed with China allow for substandard products to be imported to New Zealand and, and for us to have to accept them? No, absolutely not. And and I want to go back to Joe's point. Yep. We need a proper, and Winston as well, certification process at entry level and before. And it seems to me that, you know, that's actually not relevant to the trade deal itself. We have every right to expect the best quality products that come into here. We can debate the, the merits of the trade deal, but yep. the actual quality of the product 
clearly, given what we know about Waterview and what we know about some other um, products that have come in, is not being kept up. So we have a right as a country to do that. Equally, I also believe we have a right to say we're going to set up the rules by which we decide who makes railway wagons and who gets government contracts to ensure that Kiwi firms get a fair go at that. Right. And there yeah. was, in my view, no reason why, in the case of Hillside and the, or in the wagons, That's right. that they could not have been done in New Zealand. Absolutely. It's, blind, it's a blind faith thing. It was like New Zealand's oh. trade negotiation approach through the 1990s was like playing 500 and we made our bid lay down Mazir every time. We don't need to do that. We actually do get to have some control over this. Do you, Grant, do you think part of the problem... When you have a lay down you win. <laughs> you don't lose. <laughs> Grant, do you think part of the problem was that the certification process here was actually falsified by the Chinese company bringing the steel into New Zealand? Well, with the Waterview one, that's the allegation, yeah. is that, is, is that the, the certification documents were just not right. And But, you know, we've got to be better than that. We've got to, and, and I bet the what Winston said before, we, we should be importing the highest quality steel here. Now, you know, the truth is that the, because of things that have happened in the past, we can't meet the production levels that we need for the steel we have. We should be doing as much as we can mm. through New Zealand steel, but inevitably we will be importing some steel into New Zealand. We should, New Zealanders should be able to expect that that is the highest quality level wherever it comes from. Joe, we saw a similar situation occur with the RMTU when the government decided to close down train yards in New Zealand to get cheaper Chinese work done, and they ended up with trains full of asbestos. Shouldn't governments in New Zealand be supporting New Zealand businesses over cheaper and substandard products from overseas? Yeah, look, I think there has to be a balance. I mean, you know, we talked about, you know, the Building and Supply Act a couple of years ago was changed, and we talked about that was to sort of bring the, you know, building houses, the price of building houses down. Actually, that money hasn't flowed flowed on to, to the consumers. It, you know, everyone will tell you it hasn't got any cheaper to build a house in New Zealand, mm. but instead what we've got is more low-quality products. And Winston's right. You know, I've had a lot of water problems. You wait till you get a burst pipe in your house. Right. Um, you know, and, you know, it's almost like... We're going back to we haven't learned anything from the leaky, leaky home syndrome. Um, you know, we're, we're still um, you know suffering the economic um, you know hardship from all of those leaky building homes. You see them all over Auckland having to be stripped and rebuilt. Um, but in terms of um, you know, we need to be doing more to support our local economies, particularly places like Dunedin, Wellington. Mm. You know, those rural areas that are really suffering. Um, you know, economic hardship, you know, obviously the car industry's gone, you know, but at what point do we stop and start to look at how we can, you know, support our local communities and drive some of, um, you know, those communities? You look at Kai Tyra and all up there, we've got generational unemployment. Winston's from that area. I go out there all the time. We need to be doing more to have an economic footprint in New Zealand to support our uh, New Zealand workers. Joe, how many jobs are reliant on steel in New Zealand? Can you give me a, a, a round, round figure? Yeah, I can. There's over 1,200 people employed at New Zealand Steel. And yep. There's another 100 um, employed at what we call Waikato North Head, which is an iron sand mine at the mouth of the Waikato River. And then a predominantly Māori community in Tahara, which is south of Kafia, employs well over 100 people in a remote location. So, you know, you're talking somewhere in the vicinity of 1,400 people, but there is a wider wider catchment as well because yep. all of those people that rely all those engineering shops around Waiuku and the Waikato um, that supply stuff to the mill all of the shops the schools the nurses you know there's that wider economic base and really the mill is at the heart of that if you ripped it out we've basically got they'll be the TY of the Waikato region and you saw the government when it feels like it can jump on the bandwagon you know t they supported TY with all of those issues down there and a sense need to make sure that they are, you know, doing the same things to support this community. Absolutely. Chris, how many, sorry, how much, how much does China and America's Cold War in the Pacific feed into China threatening New Zealand's economy? Well, the Chinese were very forthright in their expression of displeasure uh, in relation to uh, New Zealand's participation in the That's right. naval exercises. Yep. They used, I think it was the Chinese People's Daily to pass that message on. Yep. Um, they would like us to steer well clear of the South China Sea's uh, 
controversy. They, they've made it clear that as a, a country that has now got a very, very important economic relationship with China, yeah. um, other things are expected of us. Right. And I don't know whether New Zealanders have yet got their head around this. Uh, it was the same with Britain, mm. frankly. It was easier because the British... You know, was the, uh, the the location of um, you know New Zealand's population. Yeah, we spoke the same language, we shared the same culture, but Britain expected us to do quite a bit in return for a guaranteed market. Sure, I mean there are you know eighteen thousand young New Zealanders lying buried in graves, um, and that was the in, price we had to pay. Yeah, in Turkey and in, in France and and Belgium. That, that was the price that was expected of us. And what does China expect from us? China, I don't think, uh, expects us to fight on her side in, in any prospective war, but she certainly doesn't expect us to be on the side she's fighting. Let's put it that way. Winston, currently China is trying to pressure us into signing their version of the TPPA, the RCEP. How does New Zealand protect its political and economic sovereignty when both America and, Co and China are so keen to take it? Well, I'd begin by ignoring all the experts you've heard uh, thus far, not on this program, uh, but uh, who have been the cheerleaders for so-called arrangements like this for a long, long time. Uh, and their record is one of constant failure and a constant loss of sovereignty and uh, progress in terms of our economy. That's the first thing I'd do. Right. Uh, if I could just say something apropos um, T.Y. Point. Please do. Yeah, sure, the government stepped up and gave them a $30 million um, uh, uh, subsidy. Uh, but at the same time, T.Y. Point is probably the world's class aluminium producer, producer the best aluminium the world's got to offer. Now, that is a fact. And yet we have got all sorts of things coming to this country, ladders which are, uh, uh, are certain to consign a user to an ACC claim before too long because they're too inferior. You've got all sorts of uh, boat trailers and stuff built from steel out of China with a two-year guarantee. And I'll tell you why I've got a two-year guarantee, because the product uh, uh, is not up to standard. Um, basically, what you're talking about is how do we go about it? Well, we've got to start uh, totally afresh with our national interest as our primary concern. Yes. Not whether or not it suits some other country's foreign policy, whether it suits some other country's economic strategy in a resource-hungry world, but whether it suits ours. And yes. that's been the major problem for a long time. We, I've heard all these free trade uh, um, acolytes and what they've got to say. Meanwhile, the gap between the rich and the poor has got greater and greater, and they have the effrontery put up the globalisation is irrefutable, irreversible. Well, you know, when the... When the British put um, gunboats up the Chinese rivers, uh, there was more free trade going on after that than anything like we've got now. There's nothing new about free trade, but it's not fair. And that's the difference between a fair trade arrangement and a protectionist arrangement for international corporate interests. Excellent point, Winston. Grant, we have a national party who have close friendships and large business dealings with many rich Chinese nationals. Morris Williams, Judith Collins, and even Jenny Shipley have personal vested interests in Chinese expansion. Has the National Party become compromised? Oh, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, the National Party do have those very close links and lots of fundraising and Judith Collins and Oravida and all of that. I think what they have become is a government that is so arrogant now that they think they can get away with anything. I mean, that's really what, what I think's happened here is that quite clearly in this situation, it needed that diplomatic response that, that Chris and Winston were talking about earlier, that you actually make sure that you are dealing with this at the appropriate level, mm. you're in control of the issue, you respect all of the issues that are going on there. This is a government who think they can get away with stuff now. And that's, that's what's really done them in here. So, look, you know, they have their own relationships, but fundamentally, if they are not um, thinking about New Zealand's interests, thinking about the way that, that this will play out strategically, they're letting us down. And I think they have let us down badly in this situation. Uh, Joe, how much pressure will come down on Pacific Steel, New Zealand Steel, to withdraw their application? 
you know, well, it's it's hard, it's hard to tell, but you know, this has really kicked up um, since yesterday. But you know, that's why I'm coming out um, strongly in support. It needs to happen. If it doesn't happen, the real question has to be asked: Why? You know, I mean, globally, there's clearly a global pattern. Um, uh, it's not just inferior steel, but there's clearly a global pattern of um, Chinese uh, dumping this. Uh, they've yeah. got overcapacity, and there's clearly a global pattern. And I've been talking to the Americans today. You know, you can see it all over the place and you know the, the this inquiry has to happen you know and you know i'd like to think that new zealand still will be supported in that and they won't bow to that that political pressure because really you know what's at stake is the future of our steel making capacity in new zealand absolutely agree with you joe chris where will our new corporate overlords be based beijing or washington <laughs> Well, at the moment we've we've got a, a fair old swag in both. Yes, uh, and but that's not that's not tenable, is it? Well, no, I don't believe it is. Uh, I, I I think that New Zealand is going to have to make a choice, and it's going to have to make that choice far sooner than the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade might like to think. Right. Um, I think what's happened over the last few months, the way the Chinese have responded to our intentions to you know, uh, run with the hares and hunt with the hounds has made it very clear that in their view, that is not a tenable uh, position. We have to wrap the show. Before we go, we'll get a quick final word from our panellists' predictions for what happens next. Winston. <laughs> well, if the path is only go by, the Prime Minister will do, will do a, uh, you know, a... If he's going to the Rio Olympics, uh, he will get a prize for the number of somersaults he does before he lands. <laughs> That's what will happen. And, uh, and, uh, and your colleagues in the media are not present right now, but as usual, they'll go along with it, and they are part of the problem. Uh, because basically, instead of uh, acting in the interests of the reader and the listener, they're acting in the interests of corporate views, uh, views that are rammed down our throat because uh, on the basis that they are right, any alternative view has been muffled, uh, censored, put on the spike and not being heard. However, uh, the great thing that's happening and what's hap what happens now is that there's new technology that has arri arrived and it's been there for some time and those that use it wisely will get their, uh, their um, views and their beliefs and their record out to the public and there's a whole new game happening as we speak. Brexit in the, U in the, in the UK was not a shock. The Australian election was not a shock. Uh, forget about what you think of Trump or uh, Bernie Sanders. That is not a shock. That's symptomatic of what is wrong with large, much of the Western world. And we've got a chance, hopefully a, a great chance, to grasp and understand that and get our story away and ensure that the public hear the facts. Thank you, Winston. Grant, your prediction? Well, if I was Todd McClay, I wouldn't be anywhere near a bus anytime soon because I've got a feeling that John Key will put him under it. Um, I think what will happen next, from here, unfortunately from here, is we, we won't hear a lot more about whether the case should be taken. I think Joe's right, and this is why we've got these rules. Mm. The rules are there that if this is happening, we should investigate it. If it's there, we take the case. Other countries are doing that. We should do that to support the industries that we've got in New Zealand. And I've got to uh, say that nothing will really change until we change the government next year. Joe, uh, prediction? Oh, well, I'd like, I'd like to think the inquiry is um, going to happen. I mean, um, you know, it's quite funny. I was run leading a lot of the commentary yesterday, and, and you know, and, and a lot of the commentary was there's no, there's nothing to be seen here, and it's really um, quite incredible how the backflip happened today. Um, and it wasn't just sort of, you know, painted the pictures, just another union um, heavy, you know, ranting and raving. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd, I, you know, I'd like to think that the government comes out strongly and says, you know, that they will support an inquiry um, and they'll do everything in their power to support manufacturing in this country. We'll keep, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep our eye on this, Joe. Uh, good man doing good things. Chris, final prediction? We will hear very little about this. Very little indeed, because that's the way you solve it. Thank you, panel. And to my final word, uh, this threat by China to our trade has always been the fear of putting all our cows in one Beijing paddock. As China ratchets up its Cold War against America and the Pacific, their role as our largest trading partner comes complete with all the strings attached. China's lowest cost capitalism model is deeply flawed because in normal capitalism, the regulatory regimes required and force cost. 
China's incredibly dodgy steel is made worse by the purposely deceptive certification process. New Zealand's interests must be run by Wellington, not Beijing and not by Washington. To do that, however, we need politicians in Wellington whose interests are here and not there. Thank you, panellists. Thank you, Fano, for watching. We'll join you again tomorrow night, 7pm, for Waitia Fifth Estate. Kia ora and good night. Waitia Fifth Estate, brought to you by Voyager Internet. Call them on 0800 4 speed.